The last time we were blessed to have Molly Fay on My Faith with Homer and Pip, she was so wonderful in talking about overcoming the loss of her brother to suicide and walking through it gracefully with her faith and reaching out to others in the area of mental illness and what have you. She had so much to share still that Homer made the right call. Let's have Molly on, a first for us to this point, for part two to talk about anxiety and depression. So many of us are impacted in some way, shape, or form with that. So Molly, a blessing to have you with us again, and we're just going to go right to Homer to get things started as we always do. Buddy? You better get this on tape because no one will believe it. I just want to listen. I've never looked forward to one of these where I said, I'm not going to have to say anything. I just want to hear Molly talk about her faith more on the Holy Spirit because I know it's going to be a part of part two. Take it away. Um, wow. Okay. So yeah, I told my uh, boss that I was going to be chatting with you guys again. So this is true. You don't often have repeat guests or you, at least you haven't yet. You're Correct. number one. Yeah. You're number one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I told him to put that in my file. So um, thank <laughs> you very much. Um, so I like what, what you, you both just said, and that is that, um, you know, that I talked about mental health uh, before uh, publicly, I did a story when I was at Fox 6 about my brother's suicide. Pip maybe uh, remembers that, although it was many, many years ago. Um, it's interesting, that story, just a tangential a side note real quick, is that uh, I remember when I did the story, I said, well, if I'm going to tell my brother's story, it's got to be the best story I've ever told. And I have been nominated for an Emmy Award before, but have never won an Emmy Award. And I did win for that story. And while winning any kind of award is fantastic, I just have always been proud of the fact that we told his story potentially the best, at least as judged by others. So but what I like about what you said is that um, I've talked about it publicly. And I think that for you to give me the opportunity to talk about this topic in particular as it relates to my own mental health, anxiety, um, as well as panic, that that is the only way that we can all truly work to end the stigma of mental health and mental illness is by talking about it. And I, I appreciate people, some athletes who you're probably more uh, familiar with than I am, as well as people like Carson Gailey, who's on the Today Show. I keep asking him to do an interview, and so far he hasn't agreed. But I appreciate people who are sort of in the public spotlight and people who have a much bigger spotlight than me talking about it, because I think it's by sharing our stories and letting people know that we struggle too, that we can do something to you know, open the, open the gate, let people talk about it, and then when people like my brother are really struggling with depression or we think he was perhaps bipolar, then maybe they're going to be that much more likely to talk about it. And I'm excited to hear about all of the school groups and groups and colleges who are now doing things to encourage mm -hmm. other students to talk about it openly and to seek help when they recognize that they're struggling. So thank you for this opportunity. That's easy. Come on. Let's go okay. to the story. Enough thanks for us. Okay, go to the story. Um, so a little bit about my story um, and then kind of the evolution of it. So it was after my brother died, um, I think it was maybe a year or two, I was working at Fox 6. I was anchoring um, Fox 6 Wake Up Morning News, and I sort of all of a sudden started feeling this panic while I was on the air, just sort of out of the blue. And for people who, who are familiar with it and people who've done research, there are sort of different kinds of panic and anxiety. Sometimes people are hit sort of out of the blue and they have a panic attack, which might feel like a racing heartbeat, or you might be sweating. For me, I was definitely out of breath. I couldn't focus my attention. It's that fight or flight um, feeling where it's like, if I don't get out of here, I'm going to die or I'm going to pass out. And it's a horrible feeling for people who've never felt it. Um, <laughs> that's great. Um, but for people who have, they know the, the, the pain that comes with this feeling like you've got to escape. Sometimes people are hit like that sort of out of the blue. And then 
for other people, it sort of happens with thoughts where you ruminate on thoughts or you're worried about something or you focus on something, usually something negative that leads to feelings of anxiety, which can be similar to a panic attack um, and don't really come out of the blue or out of nowhere. You sort of know that your thoughts have led you into this dark place. Well, I started having panic attacks on the air and doing different things to kind of cope with it, um, like telling other people to kind of take over. We had a, a wonderful person doing um, traffic at the time. Pip, do you remember Nicole Losey? She was Miss Yes, Wisconsin. I did. Sure, yes, I did. Now Nicole Phillips. She's married right. to Paul Phillips, who's yep, the college basketball the basketball coach. coach. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So she's somebody who would cover for me. And it's funny, she just wrote a book about kindness and I'm really? reviewing the book for her. And I'm just so excited because our paths have crossed again, even though we don't live in the same place. So she's just a really bright light to me. But anyway, I would do things to cover. Well, then it progressed to the point where I needed counseling. I then got psychiatric care. I started taking tranquilizers. I started taking antidepressant medication. I took some time off. I felt like I had a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, I became sort of agoraphobic where I was afraid to leave my house and I had a baby at the time. So I was kind of stuck at home. I was depressed. I was anxious and I was panicking. It eventually, um, although at the time we didn't talk about it publicly at Fox 6, that's the reason that I left the station. Um, mm -hmm. I was married at the time, but was um, supporting um, a house and my child along with my my now ex-husband who's a really good friend of mine but um we had to sell our house and um i eventually went back to work um i'm now at cmj4 i started in a part-time sales position and then 14 years ago the morning blend started and that's a whole nother story but it was about the better part of 10 years that i struggled with a lot of medication a lot of talk therapy that wasn't really helping at all psychiatric care, trying to manage anxiety and depression. And for the most part, I recovered and felt better, but I was always sort of afraid of this beast stalking me again and becoming anxious and panicky again. So fast forward to the morning blend, which started, I can't believe now, almost 14 years ago when my youngest daughter was two. I was like, I think I can do it now. I feel so much better. I was you know, still taking medication, but I felt like I was stronger, went back on the air. Well, in about two months, I started having panic and anxiety again, went back to medication. Um, and it wasn't until I started doing cognitive behavioral therapy, which was sort of the answer for me um, with an incredible doctor at Rogers, um, where I started developing tools to help me manage anxiety and panic eventually got off the medication and started living a much different life. I will say um, this last um, winter, uh, fall, winter, right until like past the first of the year, I started experiencing really ex extreme anxiety and panic again, which was extremely disappointing to me because I thought I had all these great tools and I was doing so well. And while I didn't go back on tranquilizers and all the medication, I just sort of re-familiarized myself with the things that I had learned. I started journaling and getting now finally to the point. My faith in this most recent episode um, was the greatest tool. And I used to think before this, well, all I can do is pray as if that's some sort of concession. Like I've said to you guys before, like, well, if there's nothing else you can do. I guess you got, you know, you can turn to this. Well, it turned out to be the answer was praying, connecting to my faith. I'll be honest and say, I, I felt like God totally forgot about me. Um, I felt forsaken. And um, it was my mom and my pastor who reminded me that God promises to always be with us. And he was. And what he did for me was he, the, the, the people in my life, most of them already known to me. So friends, family, coworkers, things like that were the ones who stepped up. And that's how I feel God supported me during that time was he gave the people closest to me, like my co-host Tiffany, the voice to be able to help me through another very dark time where I feel now I am feeling 
sort of recovered again and sort of like, I think of it as like remission. I used to want to be cured of anxiety mm -hmm. and panic. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not as afraid of it. I, I manage it and I'm okay with the idea that I have it. I acknowledge it. I can talk about it. And I feel, um, I feel completely different about my life at 52. Um, like I finally have learned like the most important lesson and it's taken me this losing my brother and struggling with my own mental health issues to get to this spot. Yep. You mentioned all the people. How or why do you put God in there? Someone who doesn't have a faith could say, I just want to thank those people who came most or came closely and then were necessary. And you made it clear that that doesn't fit you. How or why is that connection so strong? It's a really good question. It could, because it, what, I feel like what you're asking essentially is, let's say I don't have a faith and I'm struggling with something, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, um, can I be cured? helped, saved? Can I be, can I have intervention from a friend that's going to transform me, help me heal, help me get well? I think the answer has to be yes. Um, however, I feel that it was only because I gave up control and saw that not only that I wanted God in my life, but I needed my faith to get over it and get through it because otherwise I didn't, I was hopeless um, for a while. I feel like, and this is getting back to the Holy Spirit thing. I remember after my brother died, talking to members of my family and feeling sometimes I was saying things and supporting them in ways where I was like, where did those words come from? How did, how did I make that connection with them? And it was the Holy Spirit. There were times, especially after he passed away that I felt it. And I have felt um, divine um, intervention, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, from the people who supported me during these darkest moments. And um, do I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's God's hand in that? I, I think I would be lying or not being completely... Um, reasonable if I said I'm sure beyond a shadow of a doubt but I don't think faith is like a courtroom I don't know I would think even the most spiritual and most faithful people in my life are among those who would admit doubt and can't say beyond a shadow of a doubt because how do we believe in things that we can't see there, there were things that happened for me that helped in my healing that I couldn't no, I, I, the, the thing of my faith is whatever your answer is, is correct because it's your answer. Uh, and that's, that's always the most fascinating part to me. And did, did God talk to you one day or do you feel like you talk to him now? Or because the process just continues for everyone. Where is it now? Yeah, and I've never heard a voice. I don't know if that's what you're asking me. Did I, how, how do I hear God's, how do I, hear God's voice. And sure. I hear it from people. I hear it from people closest to me most often. And it's that they say something that connects with me in a way that I couldn't otherwise experience that leads to some sort of step forward or progress or healing or coping that I couldn't do on my own. Yeah, uh, th these are all questions with no assumed correct answer. The correct answer is your answer. Um, and I, this is my question because it's more how I am that when that occurred and you were disappointed that it came back to ever, God, come on, come on, where are you? I need you. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I was devastated. I mean, I'm, I'm raising kids, I'm doing a job. And unfortunately for me, but also fortunately, the way that my anxiety and panic manifest itself is while I'm doing my job. So it's on the air, getting ready to be on the air. I have this, it, it, it's I think shocking to people in the business who've never experienced any anxiety 
but I am t literally terrified of being on television when I'm feeling this way and I'm experiencing this panic and anxiety. It is the worst feeling I've ever had. And there were days I remember just even this past winter, um, and Tiffany will tell you this, Thanksgiving was the, the lowest time I've had in many, many years. I remember sometimes waking up and thinking, I've got to get ready for work and just feeling like I could not physically do it and just praying, God, I'll do my hair, I'll put on my makeup, I'll figure out an outfit, I will show up, but I'm counting on you to get me through this because I, I'm so afraid I don't feel capable of doing it. And it's hard to explain to people because I think, you know, I seem very outgoing. I think I am outgoing. I seem very extroverted. I seem very comfortable. I seem very um, confident. Um, I do it all the time. I've done thousands of shows. So I think some people are in disbelief. I don't think people buy. I, I mean, to be honest, Pip, I think at the time I left Fox 6, I think some of the people that we worked for didn't buy that I had this. Mm -hmm. um, issue and we're kind of like well we need you to do this show because it's going really well and I was like I cannot I did not have the tools I was just so heavily medicated and I would get up at three o'clock in the morning to do wake up news and I'd be like about to pass out in the shower and I was taking so many tranquilizers I couldn't get my heart rate to go down and I couldn't get so I wasn't just completely freaking out but um this last episode, I did at least have the experience of having gone through it before. So I knew that it was possible. I can't say that I felt hopeful, but I knew that it was possible to have recovery, which I guess um, was a good thing. But yeah, a lot of days I woke up and I was like, God, you forgot about me. I got through this before. Why am I going through this again? What, what, what does this mean? Is there any greater good or purpose that's being served? Because right now it just seems like it's completely messing up my life and my relationships and everything that I want to do. And it was Tiffany, my co-host, um, who suggested to me that I start journaling. And she said, what you need to do is think about the lessons that you're learning right now that you could not learn otherwise. So through this difficulty that you're experiencing, start journaling. What today, what's one thing you learned that if you're just feeling great and it just came like, you know, going on TV was like no big whoop and as easy as it always has been in the past, what's something that you've learned that you could not have otherwise learned? And I now see anxiety as sort of a red flag for me um, and kind of like this, there's something off balance, not necessarily chemically in my brain, but something in my life that's just not quite working. Maybe it's a relationship where um, I haven't addressed a problem or um, things like that, that it's like th th some adjustment needs to happen. The thing is the anxiety for me wasn't related to working or any problem that I was having with the show. Everything was going great. Um, but um, here's an example of, of something that I learned during this difficult time that I could not have otherwise learned. I'm sort of a, um, uh, like a highly functional, super organized, driven person around my house where it's like, um, sort of like an overachiever where there's always a project to be done. I'm always going to do it. I can't sit down and read or watch TV or go to yoga unless, you know, the dishes are done and the laundry's done and the kids have this and that, whatever. And there were times that I felt so weak and like I couldn't do anything. And that that's sort of similar to people who've experienced depression where you just feel a complete lack of energy. I was totally lethargic. And people close to me were like, you don't look the same. You don't look well. Um, and I would just sit around sometimes and talk to my teenage children or my daughter who's in college or my ex-husband who's a good friend of mine or, or friend. And I realized sometimes in life you have to just sit around and, and listen to people and truly be present for people. It's basic and maybe dumb even as that sounds. That is something I didn't know. In fact, I remember one time a couple of years ago, um, one of my kids said to me that they had never seen me sitting on my living room couch. Like, Why are you sitting in the living room? I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, because it's like, it's just, I'm just not somebody who just sits around. Because I used to think that's bad. It's lazy. You're not getting something done. And now I can be okay going to bed at night, even um, not having everything on my TDL checked off.
Well, Pip, I don't have any more. And, and this is just so good because it's so real. I think many people uh, have the exact same feelings and aren't comfortable going through that barrier to tell others. I, I, I can imagine how many people that will watch this will say they understand exactly and may not have told anyone or very few people because it's hard to do. Well, yeah, I think I, it, it can be embarrassing. Um, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, Pip, but it can be embarrassing. It can, it can seem like weakness. And to be honest with both of you, there have been times where I'm like, well, I don't know if I want my boss to know because I don't want to get fired. I, wanna, I need to keep my job. Um, and sometimes I think with um, coworkers, when I'm, like I'll say, I'm, I'm, I'm really anxious today. I'm having a tough day. And sometimes I'll think, are they annoyed with me? Like they have to put up with me, like I'm high maintenance. And they're always like, you got this, you're okay. They're super supportive and, and you know, helpful and caring and all of those things. But there's a lot of people, especially I think men, because I've known many men who struggled with severe anxiety and panic, and they are terrified of coworkers and bosses finding out they are worried that they will seem weak to, to friends and their spouse and their children. And there's so much shame. There's, there's guilt and there's so much shame that comes with mental health that I hope by talking about it, and I hope when people see other people talking about it, that they know that it's not easy. But especially if you've had the gift of healing and learning how to cope and manage, I'm so grateful for this gift of feeling so much better that I want to share the struggle so that other people see that hope and that healing because that's what it's all about. And I hope that people won't feel embarrassed and they won't see it as a sign of weakness. We all have struggles. Like um, our executive producer, she's like, you shouldn't be embarrassed. I have high blood pressure. I'm not embarrassed <laughs> of that. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that. You know, yeah. and, and we yeah. all have struggles. Can we appreciate yeah everybody and i've talked about this before but be more compassionate less judgmental more understanding more kind um and if there's if one person gets that you know or sees oh i struggled maybe they they can find hope and healing then that's that that's a blessing uh, you know, there are about 8,000 things I could say, none of which matters, because as Halver indicates, it's all about you, Molly, and how real you are. But I'm sitting here thinking that these things happen and they're bad, but God can use them for good. And I wonder this incredible profile you have as one of the most gifted TV journalists and performers I've ever come across or had the privilege to work with, now using your forum to help other people. And I love what you said, you know, it seems as if we seek our, our whole life for control, and we really don't have it. Every breath comes from him. Um, but yet, you were able to surrender and trust in him in the lowest moments, including when you were trying to keep from passing out of fatigue in the shower to get ready to go and do your segment. Uh, can you talk about that, and from that faith standpoint, how it might help others who may be listening right now who are in a similar situation as so many are, but maybe don't have that faith component or haven't reached the level that you have because of the suffering. So this is, it, it's, that's such a good point because the control thing is huge. And I am a control freak. Um, just ask my kids. It's like, I like to control everything. And my, my ex-husband who you know, Keith is always like, you don't need a project. And your project is special <laughs> to be your children or me or the people in your life but spend enough time with me I'll try to make you my project I, I guarantee you. but it's so hard to give up control when you're not feeling capable you're not feeling well you're feeling vulnerable you're scared and that's what anxiety is it's basically sort of illogical fear and if we can focus on accurate think thinking we can get through anxiety but it takes a lot of practice but the control thing, you guys, is practice. So giving up control, um, letting go and letting God, I love to say, oh, that was a lesson that I learned. I have learned this lesson a thousand times, and I'm not exaggerating. It takes practice to keep giving 
it up and giving control to God because we want to hold it. We want to like worry about things. That's also what anxiety is. And if we trust, if we let go, um, and I remembered sometimes saying, I don't, it takes too much work to let go. And so sometimes all you can do is let it be, which is mm. different. Letting something go is sort of active and it takes work and effort. Just letting it be sometimes is just not doing anything. And I think that's what God asks us to do. I think it's one of the hardest things. It's one of the biggest challenges, especially for me. And probably it does a lot to fuel anxiety and panic is that sense of wanting to have control. So I think if we can let God do the worrying and, and lay those things at his feet as he's encouraged us to do, as he allows us to do, then that's where we find faith but also where we experience healing, which is the wisdom that we get from our own suffering. Beautiful. Homer? I look forward to the book. <laughs> yeah. you saw, oh, not, did you call Sharon Faye? Did you talk to my mom? Uh, I, I don't, I did not. <laughs> she said the same. Yeah, I'm like, mom, I can't write a book. I'm too busy doing the laundry and no. the dishes. <laughs> you, don't write you, don't, you, you don't write the book. Someone else writes the book. You get a recorder and you just continually tell people your thoughts in the real and way that you have, and then someone else turns it into a book. Oh, that I might be able to do that. Yeah. I, I think there will be a season. Well. Me too. I think there will be a season. Maybe we can figure out parts three and four, Homer. This is too good. The only thing I can say is she's told one fib. Because if she's 52, I'm 32. She hasn't changed <laughs> since I, you know, when I knew you, you just haven't changed. And your mother is every bit as gorgeous, having had the pleasure of running into her. Uh, I don't know what to say other than to express our gratitude. It is our prayer, this vision of Homer's, and it doesn't happen without a producer, Brent Young, Molly, that one person could be touched. And we know you have touched countless people, and we're praying to grow this because of that. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, and you know what, you guys, thanks for the opportunity. I think it's so cool when I, I, I've told, you know, my boss and some people, I'm, I'm doing this thing with Pip and Homer. It's about my faith. And sometimes people are like, huh? And, and a lot of people probably know if they're familiar with you about your faith. But here's some, some sports guys, radio guy, TV guy. You do a little bit of, of, of everything. I think for you to speak out and give people a platform to do this is huge. I think God's very happy with you. <laughs> well, I just want to let you know, when you feel like God had abandoned you, the club is led by Mother Teresa, who spent almost her entire life feeling the same way and yeah. getting everything out of just obedience. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody knows that, and that's another one of my attempts. Did she feel that there. most of her life? A, almost her whole, She had a special person that she talked to to help her deal with this that no one found out about until they explored her life as she was going to become a saint. Yes, it's, it's incredibly encouraging to every human being on the face of the earth. I look forward to when someone says, Homer, I don't wanna hear about Mother Teresa. I know, I know, I know the story, um, but I don't know how every Christian shouldn't know that and use it as some sort of encouragement to their own situation so for sure yeah and it's i think it's um empowering to other people of faith to know that just because you know that someone is faithful and obedient like mother Teresa, it doesn't mean that they haven't struggled that they haven't doubted that they haven't had pain that they haven't had dark moments and i think that's what i'm talking about i think it's the faith that gives us the ability to smile after all of that and to still express gratitude, which I told you guys is so not just important, but necessary to living a life of joy. And that's what I think that we all deserve is to live with joy. And if we can be grateful, even despite all that stuff, then that's where it's at. I think I could listen. <laughs> I think I could listen forever and a day and, and Homer, I like, Molly, I can take advantage of his generosity. He had turned me on to this beautiful book by uh, now St. Uh, Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa, and I'm sure that he would be happy to get a copy. We'll figure that out because I think yeah, it would be I, good. I, I, right, I buddy? Yeah, I, I think you do. I think you do. 
All right. All I can say is I love you all and appreciate you. This has been My Faith with Homer and Pip. Uh, forever grateful to our, our dear friend, Molly Faye, for sharing so beautifully. And if I may, being led by the Holy Spirit. If you have any ideas for guests, we're again trying to grow it. Pass the word around. You're welcome to email me at pippinstom at yahoo.com. Pippins, P-I-P-I-N-E-S, pippinstom at yahoo.com. For Brent, for the Homer, the amazing Molly Fay. I'm Tom Pippins. Thank you, everyone. God bless. There is faith, hope, and love. We'll see you next time on My Faith Bye, with Homer and Pip. Bye-bye.